In year one, we say to children, what's five take away two? It's three. And a kid will say, what's two take away five, sir? And Missy will say, it can't be done. <laughs> and then in year two, you say, what's two take away five? And the kid will go, it can't be done. Of course it can be done, you idiots. <laughs> and you do this all the way through school. You say to children in year nine, what's root nine? They say three, what's root minus nine? It can't be done. Then you get into year 12, and they say, what's the root of minus nine? The kids go, you can't do it. So, of course you can do it. It's an imaginary number. And they go, what? I'm an adult, and you're still doing this to me. And we do this to children all the time. And they believe you, and they insert these things. And when children arrive at their GCSE exams, they are sitting there with thousands of these stupid phrases that they've been told. And they're thinking, I don't know what this is. I've seen children try to do division problems and say to me, is this the one where the rabbit goes down the hole, sir? <laughs> what? And they arrive at their exams with all these crazy phrases. You will, of course, be aware um, that the connections between concrete, abstract, pictorial language, language is often missed out, which is a shame, it mustn't be missed out. Language, symbolism, abstract is really important. When you look at classrooms in England, nearly all of the time, nearly all of the mathematics, is abstract straight away, nearly all the time. And kids will get manipulatives out in year one and apparatus out in year one. And then in year two, boom, it's gone. Just disappears. Well, when I teach undergraduates, I use manipulatives. All the way through it's needed. So I wanted to highlight that. And I wanted to just grab the 1980s um, sort of definition where they redefined it into diagnostic teaching because I like the wording of what was popular in the 1990s to provoke tension and cause cognitive conflict. When my friend asked me what do real mathematicians do, it's a really hard question to answer because what real mathematicians do for the vast majority of the time is this. <laughs> Mathematics is meant to be hard. It's meant to be hard. And learning happens at that cusp. And our art is to make sure we get that cusp just right. So the model that I'm talking about, when you look at Carlton Washburn and Bloom and Kulik and Gusky and many, many others, some people who are doing it now, there are some mastery systems that are being implemented in some England schools because a consultant told them this is what mastery are, are abysmal. But some of them are fantastic. And it's nice to see it becoming fashionable again. It's nice to be fashionable again. And I know that in five years I'm out of fashion, that's it, I'm in the doldrums. And I'm now of the age that I'll die before I get back into fashion. Hey-ho. But if you look at all of the studies across the last hundred years, what I'm not giving you here is this is what one study says. This is Bloom's mastery, this is Kulik's mastery. I'm not giving you that. What I'm doing is I'm looking at all of those ingredients and what I've done is to pick out the ones that always appear. So the common ingredients of a mastery model for schooling. And what I've done with this is to put it into a diagram. So what always appears, diagnostic pre-assessment. There is no point in trying to lay another brick unless the brick underneath is secure. There really is no point. Those bricks have to be ordered extremely carefully. Writing a curriculum is really, really hard. So they have to be ordered very, very carefully. They have to be the right order and those bricks have to be secure, which means you need questions that reveal learning. And having questions that reveal learning, writing questions that reveal learning, is exceptionally difficult. It really is. And we seem to have forgotten as educators that part of our job with questions, questions are about practice, but questions are also about revealing something about the learner so that I can act, which means you need really smart questions. So pre-agnostic, Question, uh, pre-diagnostic questions, high quality group-based initial instruction, telling them stuff. Um, a really good way of getting kids to know things is to tell them things. It really is, trust me. It's worked for thousands of years. Um, and then as they're doing stuff, formative assessment over and over and over and over and over and over. Really, if you, if you wanted to sum mastery up, it's just formative <coughs> assessment and correctives. I'll talk about correctives. Assessment as well, so testing to validate your own teacher assessment. The quality of teacher assessment around the world is not good, but we can get better at it by asking better questions. High quality correctives. Correctives must be mindful 
of the way in which someone's been taught something before. So if you spot something, and as soon as you spot it, you fix it. This is what Hattie means, in the moment, contextualised feedback. You know, if you have children, you know, if anyone here has children, you know that if your three-year-old, and they do, bless them, if your three-year-old knocks over a vase and it smashes, there's very little point sitting down three weeks later and saying, let's have a vase smashing conference and discuss that. You fix things in the moment. So we're talking about in the moment, immediately, that day, that lesson. Fixing it, spotting it, fixing it, spotting it, fixing it, all the time. And these correctives need to be mindful of how it was taught before. You know, so if you're trying to get a, ch uh, a child to understand that the tangent graph has asymptotes, with some children, you can say, uh, tangent is also sine over cos, and as cos tends to zero, we get tending off to infinity, and some kids will go, oh yeah, fair play. Other kids will go, huh? And you say, okay, let's draw a unit circle, and we'll draw that, and we can see some... You know, it starts going parallel to the axis. Did they ever meet? No. Some kids go, oh, yeah, that's kind of neat. I get that. Some kids go, oh, what? So you might make a unit circle, get some spaghetti out, and show the things actually happening. Some kids go, oh, I get that. And it's just about different metaphor and clicking at different times. And everyone does this. Every single human being clicks with different times. A really good example of a mastery uh, approach is the driving test. The driving test is a mastery approach. We all have to start our car up a hill at some point. Okay, and you're 17, your parents say to you, you've got to learn the bite on the clutch. And you're too cool to ask them, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, the bite on the clutch, yeah. And you go out and you roll back down the hill. But at some point, you get it. And at some point, you pass your driving test. All of us do, hopefully. And some of us pass it first time, and some of us pass it after 14 times, 150 times. But what we don't do with the person that took 14 times is we don't say, for the rest of their life, their car's got to have a massive dunce hat on. We say, you are the same now. You are valid. You are equal to that person that passed it first time. And this is incredibly important in this process. Everyone will click with different concepts at different speeds. The thing that varies in this process is how much time you spend on things. This, is, this was the big leap that Carlton took. He said, why don't we just spend the amount of time it takes. Teach them what they don't know. It doesn't sound like rocket science. Um, so these corrective instructions and then parallel formative assessment. And what you find in this, mathematics 320 concepts, what's really interesting about these 320 concepts is they're all infinite. Every one of them is infinite. There is never, ever a time where any child is finished. And the next time I walk into a school and I see a school and they have a set of questions and they call them mastery indicators, I'm going to punch them in the nose. <laughs> you never, ever, ever master anything. In two weeks' time, I'm 50 years old and I don't know anything. Hands up. I don't. Nothing. None of us do. You never master things. You're on the journey towards mastering things. I've seen teachers say, oh, that kid can add. Can they? Can they? Can you add? Can you? I've seen teachers say, oh, of course I can add. Then you say, do that in base seven. <laughs> can you do that? All of these things are infinite. So there's never a point where some kid has nothing to do. There's always something to do. There's always really nice, interesting things to do. Don't worry about the national curriculum. Go way beyond it. Get the 3D Bernoulli equation out. See what happens. 